Welcome to the series, Employee Health Services, Mind, Body, and Spirit. Employee Health is a section in the City of Albuquerque's Risk Management Division. Its mission is to promote a sense of community and increase wellness among city employees and their families by providing education and counseling about physical and mental health. And now, Mind, Body, and Spirit with Dr. Julia Bain. Hello and welcome to Mind, Body, Spirit. My name is Dr. Julia Bain. Today we have the privilege of speaking with David Harper, Inspector General for the City of Albuquerque. Welcome to this show, David. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here. I've been wanting to, we have been working this out for months. I'm glad you're finally here. Yeah, I apologize for some of the delays, but yeah, glad to be here. Well, you're a busy guy. <laughs> you're protecting the trust. We're doing our best. If you remember one thing about the Inspector General, remember this. He is protecting your trust in your city government. And so you did a good lead a few minutes ago about how to start this interview off in terms of you know, what you're about, and because I don't think most people know what an inspector general does. So why don't you just go with it? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity again, and again, it's, it's good to be here. Right, so uh, if you haven't served in the military or had an opportunity to work in the federal government, or I would say live east of the Mississippi River, it's probably unlikely that you've uh, encountered the inspector general concept before. So let's just give a little bit of background, a little bit of history, okay. uh, kind of talk about what the concept really is. So the Inspector General actually it's, was started in the French military and then General George Washington actually established the office as, as part of the Continental Army. Really? The, the, yeah, and the initial, the initial mission of an Inspector General was to make sure the inspector to make sure that the troops were ready to fight and that all of their equipment was in operable condition and that they had all the supplies and, and, and everything that they needed. Go figure. So, so yeah, so that's kind of the background. So our military, since George Washington has had an inspector general, every branch of service, on every military base, again, to make sure that the troops were ready to fight and do their job. Um, now the federal government actually uh, established in 1978 the concept in all federal departments. It went a little bit in a different direction. They still had the inspection piece, but they also started doing audits and investigations as well. Okay. And that was in 1978. Okay. Yeah. So it, I will give uh, the credit to Massachusetts when you get to the, the state and local level. And that was about 20 years ago, Massachusetts where this was the first state to do that. Since then, other states and other municipalities have also established it, and especially on the East Coast. Albuquerque is progressive. We're the, about the only city, I think, west of the Mississippi to actually have an IG. What do you know? Yeah. Yeah. We prevail once again. <laughs> so a little bit about the mission here in Albuquerque, if you'd like. Um, so our job is actually to investigate allegations. And th that would include like fraud, waste abuse, misconduct, that kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah. Basically what we're doing is we're looking out, as you started, to, to protect the trust of the taxpayer, the public. Mm -hmm. They put a lot of confidence in the city and they want to make sure that their interests are protected. They work hard for that money. So basically, right. it's to make sure that the, the government is using their money um, with, with a sense of integrity, mm -hmm. uh, that we're transparent, and that we're accountable. And so our job is to kind of enhance that, make sure it's being done. Well, David, can <clears throat> anyone report anybody who lives in Albuquerque? So basically, if you are, are, are an employee of the city, uh -huh. or you are a, a citizen in the city, uh -huh. um, and you become aware of something that you think is improper, um, whether it be misconduct by an official or a city employee, or you think that your money is, is being misused uh, in ways that uh, city resources are, are your, being misused. Your tax money? Absolutely. Okay. Then yes, you may give us a call, and we will take a look at it. We'll assess it. We'll talk to you. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I know the mayor, you know, when he began many years ago, was very valued transparency very, very much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously you're part of that transparency. 
Yes, we, we are certainly one part of it. I think I think transparency is a responsibility of everybody in government, you know, and uh, certainly that's probably one of the prime aspects of what we do is is to ensure that uh, that our government is transparent. And that, again, we're advocates really for the citizens and the taxpayers, um, you know, make sure that their interests are number one and that that is the priority here. So transparency and accountability go hand in hand. And we were talking earlier too about how you're very careful about making sure there is no conflict of interest or you know you really have a separation between yourself and the people that you may have to investigate. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, let's, um, yeah, you know, and, 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 and as we get into that, let me go a little bit backwards again to the history. So this office was created in 2004 by city council through, a, through an ordinance, the inspector general's ordinance. Okay. That ordinance has been, has been revised a few times since then. But one thing that's been there from the very beginning is the independence of this office. And unlike some IGs, especially at the federal level, where an IG might work for, say for instance, the Department of Transportation at the federal level, an IG works for the Secretary of Transportation. Here, we don't work for the mayor. We do not work for city council. And the purpose of that is that we are independent. So if a citizen has an allegation that, uh, that you know, even the mayor, worst case scenario, or city councilors doing something, it would be difficult for us to investigate that if we worked for the city council or for Don't the mayor. Don't bite the hand yeah. that feeds you. Yeah. So you right? can't, you've got to make sure you're not impaired in any uh -huh. way. So it's not just through uh, the appearance of it, but in fact. And so that's what helps us stay independent and be objective. And then have the, have the confidence of the community that, that we actually are independent and that we have no biases. You mentioned that you were going to go out to... Uh a neighborhood association meeting next week or something. Is that something that you will do? Will you talk to different clubs or associations or groups of people in the community who want to either, I don't know, do a group report or ask you questions about, you know, we've complained about this park for, I don't know, years, nothing's ever been done. Will you go into the community and, and give a talk? Absolutely, and that kind of comes under the outreach, and in, in a few minutes we'll kind of get into our priorities perhaps, okay. and outreach is certainly one of them. Okay. So uh, when I arrived here, it was really important to me to not only, first of all, get to know all of the city department directors and some of the, the, the strategic partners in the community at the state level as well, um, but the community too. So I reached out to a number of the coalitions and neighborhood associations. I went out and I did presentations at their at their periodic meetings. Oh, good. And, I, and I'll be doing that for the District 8 Coalition next week. I, uh, I had written a, a piece for the Albuquerque Journal about two months ago and a particular member of the coalition saw that article and uh, looked at it as an opportunity so they contacted us and so we're going to be going out and doing that. But uh, not only just the neighborhood associations and the coalitions, but other organizations, associations, civic organizations, whatever, we would be glad to come out and, and, and talk to uh, a group of citizens that have an interest in hearing what we do. Um, because again, everybody in the city interfaces and has interfaces with city services in one way or another. The most common thing you might think of is your trash collection. But if you go to a zoo, the biopark, any of those facilities, a golf course, uh, if you go to a multi-generational center, uh, there's a lot of city services that people use. The library. The library, right. So if you have any concerns or complaints about any of these services, we're the ones to call. So absolutely. Good. So people can find you, and they are. Absolutely. I get emails. I get phone calls. Um, and some people walk into our office. We're very accessible. That's our job to serve the city, to serve the community. Wonderful. So. And I want to put some of those numbers on the screen, and then I want to talk about your priorities. Sure. So Absolutely. why don't you talk about, I mean, what's your hotline number, what's your website number, and then we'll put that on the screen. Sure, yes. Yeah. So uh, our hotline um, phone number would be 768, of course, 505 area code, 768-4-TIP, and 4-TIP is 4847, so 768-4847. Okay. If you prefer to email us, you can go to tipsnow at cabq.gov. Okay. You can also go to our website, which is www.cabq.gov forward slash inspector general. And when you get to the website, there's an opportunity there to also submit. Um, 
And now, of course, the city has 311, and that's another way. Right. So we have all kinds of ways you can get something to us. And again, we're located in City Hall on the fifth floor, Suite 5025, if you just want to come upstairs and meet with us. And we're always available. Perfect. Priorities. So priorities. Well, we do have a limited office. In fact, I'll say we're the smallest department in the city. Um, we're hopeful of growing and, and getting different kinds of uh, capabilities and experience over the next few years that I'm here. Um, so we do have to have priorities. Uh, we do assess any complaint that comes in. And when we get a complaint, we look for, first of all, is it something within our purview? And if it is, if it's not, we'll look to see if it should go to another city department or another government agency at some level of government. Maybe the police department. Could be the police department. It could be a state agency. It could be a federal agency. And we will help that person get it to the right, uh, the right agency. And we do that a lot. But if it is ours, then we determine whether or not it merits our attention. And again, it's not that maybe there's not something that's you know, uh, a misconduct issue or something that's minor. But again, because we have a small staff, we want to make sure that we're doing the greater good for the greater, you know, population here. Mm -hmm. So we're, 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 we've established some priorities, and I'll go through those. Um, I think that probably the, the thing that uh, could impact the widest audience is corruption in the government, the city government, major contract fraud where we're spending millions of dollars, and systemic fraud where a particular person in a city department may have been abusing, using their position for private gain for a lengthy period of time and has gone undetected. So those are things that could have a large impact financially or trust-wise. Mm -hmm. And so those have to be our priorities. Yeah, we want to protect the trust, not have a breach of trust. Absolutely. And I would say probably the fourth one, which, and, and these are in no particular order, uh, the fourth one is probably anything that impacts public safety. So, for instance, if there is something to do with uh, fire department, uh, animal wel welfare uh, department, uh, or some of the types of uh, ordinances that we have that impact public safety, like the American Americans with Disability Act requirements, um, that's that's high uh, on our priority list as well. Uh, so, yeah, those are our priorities, and that helps us make a determination whether it's reactive or something that we're proactively focusing on. Mm -hmm. You know, probably most people don't know this about you, and I think it's really cool. And <clears> when <throat> I found, we started talking about it, I started humming the Get Smart tune. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Dun, da, da, da. I remember the doors. I'm dating myself. Anyway, yes. <laughs> special agent. You were a special agent. Could you could you just share with the community a little bit what you used to do before this and, and what qualified you to be able to investigate uh, any type of concerns? Sure. No, absolutely. I would love the, the opportunity. So I, I've been in this position just a little over a year now. I will I will say that. Okay. Um, it's been a great it's been a great opportunity for taking my prior experience and applying it to this position. And I'll explain then. So right before assuming my current position, I worked in the federal government. I retired after about 40 years of combined active duty in civil service with the Air Force. And thank you for your well, service. Well, I appreciate the comments. Thank you. And uh, yeah, my hat off to any veterans out there, of course. Um, 35 of those years, I was with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Oh, if you, my. If you've ever watched the TV show NCIS, we were the sisters. We are the sister. We were. I was. Whatever <laughs> I'm trying to say here. The sister service of NCIS. We didn't have the TV show. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways, so that's the investigative agency for the Air Force. And specifically where I spent most of my time, 30 years, of that was in white-collar crime. And I finished my career at our headquarters at Quantico, the Marine Corps base, and seven years there where I oversaw all of the fraud investigations throughout the organization at about 200 different locations. Wow. So uh, my focus specifically was procurement fraud, the big defense contractors and that kind of thing. Did you find any? Oh, yes. Yeah. There are plenty out there. I, I want to make sure I don't send the wrong message to our viewers. 99% of folks, whether it's Boeing or Lockheed or, or whether it's, uh, you know, your neighbor uh, owning a mom and pop show or, or an employee of the city are doing the right thing for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. It's that small percentage that why we need to be out there, much like the police department. You know, we need to be out there for those 
opportunities when somebody is taking advantage. And, um, and so I would say that in my last job, you know, this, the same thing held true. And, and so, yeah, certainly uh, we did a lot of investigations. And that's, those are the same skill sets that transfer here. Again, as I said in my priorities, we're looking for uh, companies out there that would take advantage of the city mm -hmm. and the taxpayers' dollars. Mm -hmm. We are looking for opportunities where maybe some employees decided to steer left when they should have went right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of a thing. So it is, it is white collar crime. I would say much of it is considered white collar. Uh -huh. um, where I came from, yes. Here at the city, we have, uh, we have misappropriation, theft of city funds. You know, it runs the gamut. Uh, some people just misusing their properties, government property, um, that kind of thing as well. So, so, but yeah, a lot of it is fraud, or wh white collar crime, and, and other types of wrongdoing. So as a result of the outcome of one of your investigations as Inspector General for the city of Albuquerque, could somebody go to jail? Technically, yeah, in theory, sure. In fact, one of, I, may, I, I said earlier, outreach was a priority of mine when I got here, and I will say that I met with the district attorney, both the, the former district attorney and, and, and the district attorney now, and, uh, and that's what the purpose of talking to them was to find out what their priorities were, what kind of cases that we might have that they might consider prosecuting. Okay. We'll be doing the same thing with the U.S. Attorney's Office. We're waiting for the new U.S. Attorney to come in mm -hmm. uh, and have that conversation. But certainly, let's just say we, the city has a $200 million contract with a company, and let's just say we find out that there's been a $20 million fraud going on, and, uh, and it violates maybe it's a lot of federal funds. So not only would you have maybe local or state statutes, you may have federal statutes, criminal statutes. So we would definitely work maybe in partnership with the FBI or Albuquerque uh -huh. Police Department uh -huh. or another agency uh -huh. uh, for a prosecution of that. So, yeah. the, so in that case that you just cited, would the $20 million, instead of going into building something at the biopark, for example, mm -hmm. It goes into somebody's bank account in Switzerland? I mean, is that where it well, goes? Well, there's possibility, depending. Certainly, uh, money laundering happens in all kinds of criminal activity. And if somebody was diverting funds, uh, it could end up in an offshore account. Uh, it could be laundered in a way that uh, we don't know, but uh, shows up in another, uh, another kind of uh, account or something. Um, you know, but, but yeah, that, that's a possibility for sure, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But one, you know, it, it's always difficult. That's one of the challenges when there is money, whether it's, whether it's a payoff for something or whether it's diversion of funds. You, sometimes it could be a challenge following the money. And that's one of the reasons we need to get a forensic accountant on our team down the road. Yeah, yes. To help, you know, tra track that kind of. That seems extremely important. And even, you know, it's sad, but true. Even in families, mm -hmm. money can destroy families. Oh, sure. You know, whether it's um, somebody didn't get a part of, of the inheritance. Right. right. Or somebody said that, you know, they had put mom's money in an account and that never really happened. Um, and it can blow up and destroy families because it turns into sometimes, unfortunately, people become greedy. Let me, let me talk just for a moment. I think this is a good point to bring up uh, what we call the fraud triangle. Don Cressy was a professor, I believe, in Stanford or UC Berkeley, and he developed what he called the fraud triangle. And uh, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners teaches this, this model. And basically, it, it explains much of the fraud and financial crime that goes on. And probably it's other called the fraud too. triangle? It's called the fraud triangle. So there's three sides to it, right? Okay. So one side would be opportunity. Um, so you have to have an opportunity. You're, in a, you're a city employee and you happen to work in a position where you can make decisions or influence decisions, maybe the award of a contract, maybe money or whatever. So an opportunity. This, the, the, the other side, the second side, um, would be uh, rationalization. And that might be wow. where, where you could explain to yourself, I've worked for the city 18 years. I've never had a pay raise. I've un I'm underpaid. I'm overworked. You know, me taking a few dollars here and there, I'm entitled to it. Somebody who otherwise would never commit fraud might commit fraud due to pressure. Let's just say, for instance, you're a father and you have a young child at home who's recently diagnosed with something horrible or in a major accident. And all of a sudden, medical bills are piling up. You normally would never do anything, you know, that was unscrupulous or whatever. But in this situation, you might rationalize 
and, and, and an opportunity might be there because of your job to help you and pay some of those medical bills. Wow, that's So that's a great the fraud example. triangle. A wow. lot of people that normally would never think to do something wrong find themselves doing something wrong one day. Uh, most of us would, would, would probably never see ourselves crossing that line, but we don't know until we get there. So that's the fraud triangle, and that explains a lot of the fraud that goes on. That's fascinating. I have never heard of that before. Yeah, so that's good to know. So, uh, you know, so we try to get out and educate the public and, and help them kind of understand what some of the indicators might be, when to recognize that. If you're a supervisor, you know, how to recognize maybe some, some types of indicators or patterns in maybe one of your subordinates or, or you're a member of the community and, and you know somebody who works in, in the city government and you start to see some unusual behavior and you know that person spends perhaps more money than than what they make. I was going to say, you know. could you give us some examples of indicators? Yeah, so uh, no, absolutely. If somebody, for instance, starts working a lot of overtime um, and they're the last ones to leave all the time, you have to wonder, is there something that changed? Is that giving them access to something? They don't want witnesses around. Um, you know, their, their time card changes, uh, for instance. Um, but yeah, also, like we talk about, that maybe they became an addict and have a drug problem all of a sudden, and it's a behavioral issue, and there you, you go. know, sadly. So yeah. there's all kinds of reasons. Gambling problems. Gambling problems. We saw that at the, fed at the state level, I think, about two years ago with the Secretary of State. You know, so it's, right. it's just recognizing a change in somebody's routine and behavior. Right. And maybe it's their mood. Maybe somebody starts coming in really irritable or, or whatever. So it's recognizing that. If you have any concerns, I would say talk to your supervisor. Um, and then, uh, and then we're always open again. And do we have a few moments to talk about the whistleblower ordinance Please. as well? Yes. Okay. So let me. Our, our ordinance dictates. Our ID ordinance dictates primarily what our job is. But there's a few other ordinances I want to talk to briefly. We have election year, so I want to talk about that for a mm -hmm. moment. And then we have the whistleblower. So there's a whistleblower ordinance. Uh, keep in mind this is only for employees, not for citizens. Okay. But. If in a, in a, and there's also a similar law at both the state and federal levels if there's federal funds. But basically, if you're an employee and you report something that you think is wrong and then you believe there's been retaliation against you, such as you've been demoted or you're fired or whatever, then you possibly have a violation of the whistleblower ordinance. And you may come to our office, you may go to your department director, but if you have concerns it involves a department director, you certainly can come to the IG at any time. We'll talk to you, we'll look at that, we'll assess it, mm -hmm. and, and then and if it's appropriate, then we'll investigate it too. Um, and, and then potentially intervene. Hopefully, yes. Uh, you know, we don't really have the power to tell, uh, you know, the, the city administration what to do. We can bring it to their attention, certainly, and, and shed light on it, and okay. hopefully that is helpful. Okay. Um, now, the other ordinance out there, basically, the city has a code of, of ethics, um, and, and uh, the city uh, requires that our office, the city ordinances require that our office uh, serve the, uh, the, the board uh, of ethics and, and campaign uh, practices, essentially that if there's any allegations of campaign fraud or other wrongdoing uh, by any, any candidates or anybody working in that process, they can come to us and we would investigate that. Uh, so for instance, right now the journal reported a few weeks ago uh, that there was a, a complainant out there who's filing a lawsuit against one of the people, one of the candidates running for one of the upcoming council positions. So the board is going to do, be doing a hearing on that, will be available should they need us to investigate that. So okay. those are just some of the other areas that we get involved in besides just fraud, waste, and abuse. Conduct unbecoming? You know, it would have to be a violation of actually an ordinance or state law, you know. Okay. Uh, I don't want to get into judging what conduct I'm becoming DWI? Uh, you know, um, I... Ludity? Yeah. I mean... It would have to be probably a violation of campaign funding, rules that govern how you use campaign oh. funds and that kind of thing. I see. So not, not character issues. I think the voters are going to have to be the ones responsible <laughs> for judging character. Yeah. <laughs> Not character issues. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, they still have that. You know, there's a lot of power in the pen. Uh, and, and, you know, that brings me to another comment I will make. I sometimes do get citizens concerned, engaged citizens who I adore 
because we couldn't do this without citizens. But sometimes the complaints do go to what they consider to be bad policy or poor decisions that were made by, by elected leaders or appointed officials. And bad policy and, and what's perceived as a bad decision, we don't really have any control over. Yeah. Um, so usually I just tell the citizen, yeah, you know, you guys are more in control of that than I am at the voting booth. Mm -hmm. So, but we are here should you become aware of something or believe that something illegal or in violation of an ordinance has happened. Okay, good, good to know. Glad you're yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, We've got about five minutes, so I want to make sure you get whatever important points yeah, um, no, absolutely. To our audience. Yeah, you, you know, I, 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 there's a couple things I just kind of wanted to cover here. And yeah. uh, so uh, I, want, I wanted to, um, to, to make sure that I didn't, didn't um, miss anything here. I want to make sure that, first of all, I don't leave the wrong impression again. Um, and that is, I believe that 99%, like I said before, of public employees are here because they want to serve. They want to do the right thing. Many of them have formerly served in the military or other organizations. And they are here and they're doing the right thing as public servants. Um, and so that's the first thing I want to say. It's and, a calling. Yeah, and you're the one who said that to me a few months ago. It you is. said, you know what, being a public servant is a calling. And I remember saying to you, you're absolutely right. It really is. And so that's the first thing. I certainly don't want people to take away from this that, that, that we think that there's a lot of fraud going on or there's a lot of misconduct yeah. or that people are corrupt. No, it's just the opposite. Most people here are working hard. Many of them are, stay the extra hours if they need to. Mm -hmm. They'll come in on a weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, we have folks here work shift work. Mm -hmm. And I will say, have, coming from the federal government, the pay here at the city level, the city level doesn't compare. So a lot of people are here because they want to serve. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, it's so important to make sure that we applaud them. And it's so important that we protect the image of, of the, of the uh, public servant as well. Thank when there, you. Yeah, when there are... When there are a few bad apples, it's all of our best interest to help either those folks get straight and narrow again on the right path or make room for somebody who's willing to do that. Um, and really the reason all of us are here serving is because we owe it to the citizens who are working hard to pay our salaries. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so we're really here to serve them. Absolutely. You know, so, so really they are our number one goal as a citizen in the city. Mm -hmm. um, I've always believed that the higher you go, the more you serve, servant leadership. You know, um, we don't climb the ladder to have people serve us. We climb the ladder so that we have a more impact in our service to others. What a great way to put it. Yeah, and that's again, not just for uh, this, the community, but we wanna make sure that our employees that working for us are well led, that we help develop them too. We owe it to them as well. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, so the IG is here to, uh, to make sure that we advocate for, for a, a better government, a more efficient government, a more accountable government, and that, uh, and that we're here to protect the public's trust. Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, we're here awesome. to serve. Yeah. Next time I facilitate supervisors training, I'm going to quote you uh, <laughs> and let them know that you're behind them, uh, behind good leadership skills. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's a partner approach. It's collaborative. Um, you know, we work together, I think. So I don't know if we have any time left. We have two minutes. Two minutes. Then I'll just quickly say this. I reached out to the chief administration officer today with some ideas. I benchmarked from other IGs around the country. The city of Philadelphia has a great program where they have an integrity officer in every department in the city. Wow. And uh, that integrity officer collaborates and partners with the IG office in the city. That's amazing. So I, I uh, proposed uh, with the chief administration, Mr. Rob Perry, to... To, to discuss this, and so I'm on his calendar for next week. We're going to talk about that that idea. Um, I would like to see uh, an opportunity to partner and work closer together. Again, we're all on the same side here to serve our, our community. And I think anything that we can do to improve that process and improve our services is is the right thing to do. I think that would be fantastic. I'm we're, so glad you brought that up. Yeah. So, anyways, and I welcome ideas. If anybody out there has any other really good ideas, we give out our contact information earlier. I encourage folks to get out to reach up to us and we'll do our best to, to make sure that we're, we're taking every advantage to do better. You have an open door policy. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Literally, I, I have no receptionist that sits out front and checks names and has you take a seat. In fact, I've had people surprise me walking to my office and standing over my shoulder before. <laughs> 
So we truly have an open door policy. And again, uh, email and, 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 and you could reach me at, if you want to reach me directly, it's uh -huh. David Harper at CABQ.gov. That's my direct email address. Perfect. David, I appreciate you. Absolutely. And I know the rest of the community does as well. Thank well, you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your time and making this possible. Appreciate you. Thanks. And I appreciate you tuning in. This is Dr. Julia Bain. Until next time, be happy and be well. This has been Employee Health Services Mind, Body, and Spirit. For more information, call the City of Albuquerque's Employee Health Services at 768-4613. Let the Employee Health Services staff let you be your best at work, at home, and at play.